Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on June 20th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Former President Donald Trump was indicted and pleaded not guilty in Miami last week on 37 federal counts related to allegedly improperly handling classified documents and refusing to return them to the government. This hour, we'll speak with a law professor about what the indictment means and what the court will consider. And I want to know what you think about the indictment. How do you think the case will turn out? How will it impact next year's elections? I'd like to hear from you. And the best way for that is by email or by text. You can email dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. So right now, I want to welcome our guest, who is Stetson University College of Law Professor Louis Varelli. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Professor Varelli. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you're able to come on today to talk about this very important topic. So uh, let's let's go uh, get right into it. But before we get to the details of the charges, uh, this is the way the AP described the kind of the gravity of this moment. The indictment marks the first time in U.S. history that a former president faces criminal charges by the federal government that he once oversaw. So what would you say about the historic nature of a former president being charged with 37 federal felony counts? Well, there's no question this is unprecedented, and there's no question that it's a significant moment in American history and American government. Um, it is, um, although unprecedented, less surprising in light of some of the events since 2016. We've encountered lots of unprecedented situations um, involving the executive branch in the last five to seven years. So um, I do think unquestionably it's unfortunate, not necessarily there was an indictment, but that the situation that gave rise to the indictment occurred at all, right? This is not a happy time for American democracy and how we handle this, both as an electorate um, and as a government is going to be important for us going forward. And we'll try to talk about some of that, at least during this hour. Uh, well, let's talk about the charges right now. Again, according to the AP, Trump has pleaded not guilty last Tuesday in Miami to federal charges that alleges that he hoarded classified documents detailing sensitive military secrets, and he schemed to thwart government efforts to hold to get them back. There were 37 felony counts, many under the Espionage Act. So let's start there, maybe. What is the Espionage Act and why was it created? Well, the Espionage Act is, and I should um, provide the caveat that I'm not a criminal lawyer, I'm a constitutional lawyer, but the Espionage Act is a law that's designed to protect national secrets. Um, its title is somewhat um, a red herring in a situation like this, right? President Trump's not being accused necessarily of being a spy. He's being accused of knowingly mishandling or willfully mishandling sensitive documents that don't belong to him, which is a serious charge. Um, so when we think of espionage, we think of spy craft and James Bond and the like. Um, espionage is a category of conduct that would fall under the act, right? If you are secreting um, American documents away to a foreign power in a way that they're, you're not supposed to, then of course you've committed a felony that would look like spying. Um, but it covers a broader range of activity than that, like um, improperly handling, keeping, and um, managing confidential and classified information. Do you have a handle on some of the types of prosecutions that have been handled under the Espionage Act in the in the past and whether people were found guilty? I'm not an expert in the history of the act. I know that it's used rarely. Um, and I know, of course, that it's never been used against the chief executive, against the former president. Um, and part of that is because the president um, has unquestionably access to all of this information, appropriately so, while in office, and that in the history of the country, we've never had a president who has sought to keep documents in this fashion. And I think that's a really important point going forward. So the Espionage Act um, is brought to bear here, I don't think lightly, and I don't think in a way that um, is hard to explain in light of the alleged conduct. This is notably different than other examples we've heard of recently involving former presidents or former vice presidents, for example, having access to classified information beyond their presidency. What makes it different? Because as you pointed out, we've heard names like Mike Pence and Joe Biden who've all had documents like this. So why is this one different? This one's different because of the length of time and the conduct of the former president. So in all of the other examples, at least as far as I'm aware, and um, I think um, your listeners have access to the same information. They'll confirm this. Um, all of the other examples mentioned, so Hillary Clinton having information on her um, email server and um, President Biden finding information 
um, in his garage and Vice President Pence having information in his office, all of those situations were met with contrition and immediate disclosure. Right? When those documents were discovered, there was every reason to believe for all three cases that it was an accident, that these folks have access to lots of documents, many of which are classified, and that um, whether it's understandable or, or um, whether we are comfortable with the idea or not, it was an accident and they were turned over immediately. Here we have a very different situation where President Trump had these documents for a year. Um, I don't think it's terribly controversial that he delayed returning them or refused to return them. And there's lots of evidence in the indictment. And I'm again, that um, still has to go to trial, but there's evidence in the indictment that he knowingly withheld these documents and refused to turn them over. That is a much different set of choices. And it's important for folks to remember that when President Trump is making these choices, he is not the president of the United States anymore. You, you stop being president very abruptly in America when a new president takes office. When that inauguration happens, you are no longer, frankly, anything with respect to the government and all of your responsibilities and powers in the, um, in the office go away immediately. And past presidents have all understood that, even if they've made um, mistakes in terms of not locating all the information they had to turn over, they did voluntarily. That did not happen here. My guest is Stetson University College of Law Professor Louis Varelli, and we're talking about the indictment of former President Donald Trump. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Professor Varelli, one of the things that uh, is notable, especially for those of us in this state, is that the while the federal grand jury occurred in Washington and they heard testimony for months, the Justice Department filed the case in Florida, and that's where Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort is located, where allegedly these documents were found, uh, and where many of the alleged acts of obstruction occurred. So what can you tell us about the significance of where the case is filed? Mm -hmm. The biggest consequence is the is the judicial pool that is a judicial pool and the jury pool that are available to hear the case, right? So um, by filing the case in the Southern District of Florida, the prosecution solves any potential venue problems, right? There's no question that conduct occurring in Mar-a-Lago would be subject to criminal um, prosecution in and around Mar-a-Lago and the federal district that includes Mar-a-Lago. Um, so that makes it a relatively natural location for the case. Um, the consequences are that Judge Cannon will be presiding. Um, Judge Cannon is a Trump appointee who overheard, um, who oversaw um, sort of earlier permutations of this issue, um, appointed a special master to review documents, um, made us several rulings that seemed um, deferential to former President Trump's authority and privileges, all of which or most of which were um, clearly and sort of vehemently struck down by the Court of Appeals. Uh, a, a pretty direct ruling overturning her decisions was issued by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which for the record is not known to be a particularly liberal or progressive circuit, quite the opposite. So um, Judge Cannon has some relationship with this case. It appears to be relatively deferential to President Trump. That is not to suggest she will continue in that posture, right? She is a federal judge who is life tenured and salary protected. She has the independence to um, behave otherwise, but um, that's going to be a focus of this. Um, the other issue is the jury pool. We see uh, protesters outside of Mar-a-Lago. Um, it is a part of the state that voted for President Trump, and the jury pool is going to be drawn from the Southern District of Florida. And that um, is always something that prosecutors and defense attorneys think about. And and so let's go back then to the judge, Eileen Cannon. Um, and you said that some of the, the previous decisions that she's made have been deferential to the former president. Um, what What types of actions, what role does the judge play in a case like this? What types of um, maybe deferential, if, if that's were to happen again, how could that play out? How might that play out? Well, for starters, it's important for people to understand that um, Judge Cannon will not be deciding whether President Trump did or did not do the things that could lead to a guilty verdict, right? That's the jury's job. Finding the facts belongs to the jury. And this case is going to be fact intensive. Did the president withhold documents? Did the president misrepresent um, the documents that he had, whether or not he would return them, things like that that are in the indictment. Um, but the judge has a lot of power here. The judge manages the case and the judge will make evidentiary rulings, such as whether certain information can be heard by the jury um, and whether so certain information is, for example, privileged because of discussions the president had while president, perhaps, right? Most of the information in the indictment appears to be post-presidency, but it is a cloudy issue in American law how long presidents retain um, privilege over their conversations about things relevant to their presidency. And we can imagine that the reason we want those, those conversations to be secret on one level 
is because we want presidents to be candid with their advisors because they make difficult decisions. Um, and it would be a little nonsensical to say the minute after you're president, everything you say or have said is no longer privileged, right? That would chill presidents while president from saying things that could be discovered later. But the flip side of that is we can't protect these things forever, right? By having been president for four years doesn't entitle you to legally protected secrecy for the rest of your life. So the judge is going to have to make some decisions about issues like that. And Judge Cannon, in her previous rulings, has indicated that she favors presidential privilege, executive privilege, perhaps more robustly than other judges have, including the U.S. Supreme Court. So that's going to be something to watch. And on that subject of presidential privilege, how far does that go? I mean, if a president, even when they're a sitting president, if they were to admit to a close advisor that they committed a crime, and then that then later the government found out from that evidence, from the, from the advisor, is that inadmissible just because it's a, a privilege? That's a very good question, right? That's, that is one of the interesting things about a case like this is we have very little precedent and very little um, track record to follow in terms of decisions like this. President Nixon made a claim of privilege over the tapes in his office in the 1970s and lost. Um, but he lost because he said, these are privileged because I'm the president and because I'm the president, they are privileged. He made an absolute privilege argument and lost that argument. So we know that by virtue of being president, you don't get to keep everything you want a secret. There has to be some public interest rationale, some national interest rationale. President Trump has never offered any national interest rationale, as far as I'm aware, in the cases that have been decided by judges involving his claims of executive privilege. Um, but we're going to see those issues at least become available to him in this proceeding, I would assume, right? I'm assuming there's going to be times during this trial where there's going to be some claims that you can't reveal that conversation or that document because it's privileged. And Judge Cannon is going to be the de initial decider of that. Um, and that's going to that's really where I think the majority of her influence lies. I want to remind people that our guest is Stetson University College of Law professor Louis Varelli. And we're talking about the indictment of por former President Donald Trump. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. We're live on June 20th right now. And now might be a good time for us to listen to a couple of minutes of what former President Trump said after he pled not guilty. He went to, of course, he was a, a politicking a little bit in Miami right afterwards, but then he went to Bedminster Country Club in New Jersey to give a speech. We'll listen to a couple of minutes of this. Uh, the first minute or so is is not as great audio quality. The, the audio quality does get better in the second half. So, but here's a little bit of what President Trump said. <laughs> sitting president had his top political opponent arrested on fake and fabricated charges of which he and numerous other presidents would be guilty right in the middle of a presidential election in which he is losing very badly. This is called election interference and yet another attempt to rig and steal a presidential election. More importantly, it's a Political persecution, like something straight out of a fascist or a communist nation. This day will go down in infamy, and Joe Biden will forever be remembered as not only the most corrupt president in the history of our country, but perhaps even more importantly, the president who, together with a band of explosives, thugs, misfits, and Marxists, tried to destroy American democracy. But they will fail and weak and better. Charging a former president of the United States under the Espionage Act of 17, was it meant for this? An act for a crime so heinous that only the death penalty would do, and threatening me with 400 years in prison for possessing my own presidential papers, which just about every other president has done, is one of the most outrageous and vicious legal theories ever put forward in an American court of law. The Espionage Act has been used to go after traitors and spies. It has nothing to do with a former president legally keeping his own documents. As president, the law that applies to this case is not the Espionage Act, but very simply the Presidential Records Act, 
which is not even mentioned in this ridiculous 44-page indictment. Under the Presidential Records Act, which is civil, not criminal, I had every right to have these documents. The crucial legal precedent is laid out in the most important case ever on this subject, known as the Clinton Sox case. You know what that means? After leaving the White House, Bill Clinton kept 79 audio tapes in his sock drawer. They included discussions of U.S. military involvement in Haiti, discussions of U.S. foreign policy, both defense and offense, against Cuba, recordings of President Clinton's conversations with all of the many foreign leaders at the time. Think of that. Well, that was former President Donald Trump speaking last week in New Jersey, right after he pled not guilty to uh, 37 charges in a Miami court courtroom. And you're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. I'm Sean Canaan. We're speaking with Louis Farelli, who's a Stetson University College of Law professor. And we're going to talk a little bit about what President Trump just said there. Uh, one of the things that he said is that the Espionage Act should not apply because it's his own documents, his presidential papers, that instead, if there was any violation, it should come under the Presidential Records Act. So your thoughts there about that, Professor Varelli? Well, this goes to something we were talking about before, right, which is the specifics of this case. Um, I'm not privy to any of the conversations the special counsel had, obviously. I don't know personally or have not talked to any of the people involved, but um, this was not a um, prompter or um, a quick decision made by the Justice Department and the special counsel, right? So first of all, we have a special counsel, which means we have somebody who is not responsible to President Biden or controlled by President Biden making these decisions. Um, and it took them a long time to make this decision, and they compiled a lot of evidence. And the evidence demonstrates willfulness and intentional um, avoidance of responsibilities and the intentional the intentional um, sort of squirreling away of documents that, um, with all due respect to President Trump, don't belong to him. They are not his presidential records, right? Classified documents don't belong to the president once the president leaves office. Um, it's important for people to remember, as I said before, a former president is former lead the president. They have no governmental role any longer. So they are not entitled to the same um, access to information that they would be as president. Of course, they're not, right? Because then we would have five to six people on the planet at any given time, right? Accessing um, classified information well after they were elected or not elected um, by the American people. So it's just not true that they're his presidential records. And it's not true that this is an ordinary Presidential Records Act situation. He was asked for these documents for a year by the National Archives and refused to turn them over. And there's no reason given for that other than he wanted to keep them. And we know that he didn't keep them responsibly because keeping them in Mar-a-Lago is not a safe place to keep them. And we know that they that he, or at least according to the indictment, was alleged to have shown them to people who he knew weren't allowed to see them. Um, these are all very different allegations, right? They demonstrate sort of a pattern of intentional defiant activity by an ordinary citizen of the United States at the time with respect to very sensitive information, at least allegedly. So um, again, I'm taking the indictment on its word, not to say that it's true, but describing what is alleged. Those allegations are not Presidential Records Act allegations. They are um, far more serious than that. And on the note of, of uh, the, the president, when they're in office, of course, can declassify things as they see fit. Uh, how far does that extend? Is that if it hasn't been officially declassified, is there a process? Is there some sort of um, records review that happens and now a, a document is declassified or can they just do it on a whim and perhaps the president can make the argument that, oh, on his last day in office, he just declassified all these things so they're no longer classified? He certainly can't declassify them without creating a paper trail that they were declassified, without documenting that they were declassified. Um, and he certainly can't declassify anything after he's no longer president. Um, as I understand President Trump's claims, he's never claimed that he went through any process of declassifying any of these documents while president. Um, he wishes they were declassified now, I would imagine, but nobody, as, I, as I've heard it, has made a colorable claim that they are in fact no longer classified documents. And I believe, and of course the, um, the listeners can check me on this, but I believe, um, that the Trump administration or President Trump is admitting 
that they were class they were classified at that while he was holding them in Mar-a-Lago. Um, so it is not as simple as the president wishing they be declassified. Um, they have to he has to actually go through the trouble of declassifying them, which he did not do. Our guest is Louis Varelli, a Stetson University College of Law professor, and we're talking about the indictment of former President Donald Trump. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Another thing that the former president said there is that he called this prosecution election interference and yet another attempt to rig and steal a presidential election. I, I know you're you're not going to get too much into the politics, of course, but uh, regarding the the uh, the the indictment, does is does this appear to be a political indictment or a, an indictment based on laws that were broken? Well, I would say it this way. Um, certainly, President Trump, by using the word "another attempt," is implying that the election that he lost in 2020 was somehow improperly decided. And as we all know, there's not only is there no evidence of that, there's a tremendous amount of evidence to the contrary. Right? Over 70 federal judges all found the election to be valid. Nobody found the election to be invalid in any way. Um, so no legally authorized entity, including Trump appointed judges. So um, on so some of this appears to be the same narrative he's been um, pursuing since he lost the 2020 election. Um, as to whether this is political, so um, I this is a difficult case. It's a difficult case to prove, especially with the jury pool that comes from a district where President Trump has lots of support and very vehement support. Um, I would encourage people to think of it this way. If running for office is in some way an immunity from criminal suit because you're running for office, then we've entered into a bit of a realm of absurdity, right? There isn't an election going on now. President Trump has declared a candidacy. He's not the GOP nominee yet. As long as he is willing to keep running for president, I would ask, when would this prosecution be appropriate? The answer is never, right? So on the one hand, running for office can't be a defense against being prosecuted for committing a crime. The next question is, was this crime significant enough to charge a former president with? And I, I do think we should think of it as charging a former president, not a presidential candidate. Because again, running for president just requires a press conference saying you're running for president and a modicum of fundraising at this point. Um, he hasn't won anything yet. And I would say to the listeners, this is unprecedented in terms of conduct. Reasonable minds can disagree about whether it should have been brought as a criminal prosecution, but the allegations in the indictment support criminal penalties, and they represent conduct that is not only unprecedented, but if true, something that we should all be very, very concerned about. A former president of the United States should not be keeping sensitive information after their president because it's the wrong thing to do. And they should not be showing it to people or bragging about it or storing it in a bathroom in a public resort, in a resort that's open to the public, under any circumstances. So is there an argument that this case should not have been brought? Yes. Is there an argument that it's purely political? I think no. I think there's plenty of um, sort of criminal foundation here. And the conduct is particularly um, stark that um, there's a lot, there's more arguments for saying that it's simply the application of the rule of law. And then I would remind listeners that if running for office is a reason to not be indicted for something you've done in the past, then we've created a really um, dangerous cycle where all a former president has to do is keep declaring their candidacy in order to avoid any criminal liability that they rightfully accrued or may have rightfully accrued. Our guest is Stetson University College of Law, Lewis, Professor Louis Varelli, and we're talking about the indictment of former President Donald Trump. On Tuesday Cafe, I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And our phone screener just pointed out something that uh, just came out on the New York Times. Here's the headline and the subheadline. The judge in the Trump tr documents case sets a tentative trial date as soon as August. And the it, it all goes on to say that the judge has set an aggressive schedule for the trial. So, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know all the details about that yet or, or any, very much of the details, but does that indicate to you any any kind of hint about how this might play out or about why the the judge might have uh, decided that we're going to start to s hear some things about this as soon as just a couple of months from now well, and I'm of course I'm hearing about this for the first time too but if um if in fact there is a trial set for August that's very aggressive um and that would indicate that judge cannon wants this proceeding to be as far from the election as possible in time which I think is, um, and um, my opinion should not necessarily matter to her, but from my perspective, I think that's a good idea. 
um, because I don't think this trial has anything to do with the forthcoming election, as I just indicated, or at least it doesn't have to, and it shouldn't. Um, if President Trump is acquitted, then he should be able to run for office unencumbered by these charges. Um, but the only way to do that is to resolve them um, in a trial. I am surprised that the defense would not or would agree to that trial. They, they don't necessarily have to agree to it, but I would imagine that Judge Cannon um, got their input. Um, and we'll see if maybe there are motions for continuance. There are things the defense can do to push that date out. But an aggressive trial date, I think, um, is useful to separate this case from the pending election, which I think is overall a good idea. We're speaking with Stetson University College of Law Professor Louis Varelli on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. Let's talk a little bit more about the specifics of what is in the indictment here. I'm reading from the AP here. Uh, the documents that former President Trump stored, prosecutors say, included material on nuclear programs, defense and weapons capabilities of the U.S. and foreign governments, and a Pentagon attack plan. He's accused of showing off to some people who did not have a security clearances to view them. And besides that, according to the indictment, he repeatedly sought to obstruct government efforts to recover those documents, including by directing Walt Nauda to move boxes and also suggesting to his own lawyer that he hide or destroy, destroy documents sought by a Justice Department subpoena. So why don't you um, maybe comment on, on some of the things that are in there that we haven't talked about already, which I know we've talked about a lot of that so far, but maybe um, maybe one place to start is Walt Nauda. He's, uh, he was a, a close associate of Trump's who is also indicted in, in a related case. Well, I would say there are there's sort of two categories of conduct you described in those two different parts of the indictment. The first one um, might rise to the level of criminality, so to disclose, I mean, it would, disclosing classified documents to people um, who are not knowingly unqualified or um, illegal, not legally permitted to see them. Um, at a minimum, right, an absolute bare minimum, that shows a lack of judgment and an attitude about government documents and secrets that um, does not suggest someone's competency to be president. Right. Now, people can make their own decisions about that, but that is a very, very serious set of choices for anyone who has held that office to, set, to be comfortable even suggesting that documents that were so recently active and part of their files and are classified be shown to anyone who can't see that. Um, that is a judgment problem at bare minimum. It is still likely a legal problem. The second thing is sort of a more glaringly criminal choice, and that is the intent to keep these things that knowingly don't belong to the president. And at that point, at least the indictment would indicate the president was aware they don't belong to him and was aware that they were being requested and was actively trying to mislead the government from ret retrieving documents that not only belong to them, but um, impact national security. Um, that's a, that's sort of the core of criminality. And that's where, at least in my view, this case distinguishes itself from all other examples, right? A desire to trick and deceive and mislead the appropriate authorities who, to, to whom these documents belong in order to keep them himself for reasons that don't seem obvious other than, I don't know, vanity or hopefully not something more nefarious is really, really problematic. When the indictment was announced, two of the lead lawyers of the Trump team announced their resignation just the morning after. And uh, um, the notes and recollections of another attorney, M. Evan Corcoran, are cited repeatedly throughout the 49-page charging document, suggesting that prosecutors envision him as a potential key witness. So uh, a, a, an attorney as a potential key witness for essentially for the government, for the for the prosecution, will Trump challenge Corcoran's testimony and the evidence because it, it, he will consider it to be protected by attorney client privilege? I would expect he would. I don't know enough of the details of their relationship or why the prosecution thought that that material was no longer privileged. Um, I would be surprised if someone with the special um, prosecutor's experience and knowledge was unaware of that potential problem and didn't make a decision based on the law. But I don't know that firsthand. Um, but I would suspect that President Trump would seek to keep all of that information out on privilege grounds. And I would assume that the prosecutor has an answer to that, although we don't yet know what it is. What would be the standard? Waiver. If that information had been made public to somebody other than the lawyer and President Trump, 
Um, so if it had been disclosed to a, an associate of the president's who was not um, receiving legal advice from the, that lawyer on that issue, then you would argue that it had been waived. And I would suspect there's some argument based on waiver that the prosecution at least feels comfortable enough with that they included the material in the indictment. Um, I think it's important in situations like this also for people to question what they read, but also to not assume that the professionals involved have become divorced of their professional expertise and faculties, right? We have an experienced prosecutor. That doesn't mean everything he did um, is right or that all of his allegations will be proven at trial or that the president will be convicted. Um, but to include material from a former attorney in an indictment is and a significant enough choice that I'm assuming that an experienced, competent prosecutor would have an explanation. We'll still, we'll find out whether that's true, but I don't think that's a bold assumption. Our guest is Stetson University College of Law. Professor Louis Varelli, we're talking about the indictment of former President Trump. This is Tuesday Cafe coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And uh, I was reading a political article that talked about what some of the possible defense strategies might be for the Trump team. So I uh, might run through one or two of these to just get your idea of how these might play out uh, or how they, you know, they would play out in a typical case, perhaps. Um, so first, the first one they mentioned is the motion to dismiss, and Politico describes this as a high bar to, that that they would ask the judge to they would try to prove to the judge that some or all of the counts are legally deficient because of things like either selective prosecution, for example, Trump singling out when Hillary Clinton did uh, uh, kept emails uh, um, from from the. In, on her own servers, or the theory that Trump had the in inherent authority to declassify and remove material upon leaving office. I think we've addressed that second one first, but in general, how high, high of a bar is it to dismiss the case if the, if the Trump team asks the judge to dismiss it? It's a very high bar. Now, of course, in a case involving a former president, all of these rules become a little more fluid, right? Because we have considerations that are not typical in the criminal law. But um, a selective prosecution claim would have to show um, basically malice or um, or bias against President Trump. And I think the allegations here are unique enough and distinct enough from all the previous cases, as we've talked about before, that I think that's very, very difficult um, to show. And for Judge Cannon, who's already under a fair amount of scrutiny in a case like this, um, I think were she to make a ruling like that, she would have to have a very strong basis. Now, again, I'm not privy to all the facts, so it might be that um, that bar is reached. But from what we know now, I think it's very unlikely. And if I think a federal judge is reticent to do that, um, first, because it calls basically um, that calls the prosecutor's decisions into question in terms of their um, good faith, which there's no reason to, to doubt here on its face. Um, and it's a very unusual circumstance to dismiss a case. And the next uh, a point that Politico points out is that the, the discovery phase could be a way that the Trump team could kind of get around being prosecuted and uh, being convicted, that is. And they say that the government has to disclose lots of information to the defense right now, and the scope of that discovery is often challenged by defendants. So Trump's team might file for more discovery from the government, and they may find that there's exculpatory evidence or inconsistencies among witnesses. What, how, how uh, likely is that based on what you know about the indictment? Well, it's very difficult to know um, sort of what evidence might be disclosed without knowing, of course, what it all is. It is true as a matter of constitutional law that the prosecution has to disclose to the defendant exculpatory evidence. It's a case called Brady v. Maryland um, from several decades ago. So that's true. If the prosecution has evidence that would um, that would um, find President Trump not guilty or that would um, make the charges against him inapplicable, then they have to disclose that. And that's a very good rule in American jurisprudence. It's a good rule of law rule. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have any. Um, the other feature you're talking about, sort of the discovery problem, is going to um, call on what we talked about earlier. So some of the claims of privilege um, of the role of the president in a case like this as defendant, some of those legal arguments will likely be made. And that's why the um, recent New York Times or the very recent New York Times um, reporting that you cited to me while we were on the air is interesting to me. If, if Judge Cannon thinks they're going to trial in August or has set a trial date in August, um, that would suggest only a month and a half for discovery. That would indicate that she doesn't anticipate many issues. Now I'm, again, only repeating what you said. I'm certain that what you told me is what you heard also. 
Um, but without knowing more about that, um, I can't say much more. But if the New York Times reporting is in fact that their trial date is in August and that's true, then that belies some of the discovery opportunities that the defense might have to delay the case. And another point that Politico said is that they the defense might motion to suppress or to exclude some evidence if they think that it was unlawfully obtained in violation of the former president's constitutional rights. And in here, they cite the example we talked about a little bit earlier, where the lawyer, Evan Corcoran, may have uh, that some of that testimony they might try to exclude. Right. And so what I, I think, and I'm, I'm uh, hypothesizing from afar here from the sidelines, but I think the greatest opportunity for the defense team here is to try to complicate the pretrial part of the case um, by relying on President Trump's status as the former president to raise legal issues about what he is and is not accountable for or what can and cannot be disclosed in a trial. Right, so that there's that's the larger theme that covers most of what we've just talked about. Right, am I going to um, be able to protect what I told my lawyer, even if I told somebody else? Am I going to be able to protect what I told my advisors because I was president? Um, did I somehow declassify these documents implicitly by virtue of my status as former president? I think that's a very difficult argument to make, but that doesn't mean they won't all be made. Um, the primary feature of that, assuming that they don't all succeed, is delay which of course benefits the president in the sense that the closer we get to the election, the more his claims about this being politically motivated um, at least may, may garner some traction among voters, which ultimately seems to be um, the primary goal here. And I'm going to extend this out as, as um, much as possible, as far as possible. Let's say the, the trial is still going on in November of next year. Um, does that change? The, and, and then let's say that Trump is elected. How would that change things from a legal standpoint? Obviously, from a political standpoint, it would be a complete it would be complete chaos. But would at that point the trial be moot if if we're now talking about the the uh, president elect? I don't think it would be moot. The question would be, can the president pardon himself? And that's a very difficult question. And um, we do not. Well, frankly, we don't have an answer. I don't know how difficult the question is, but it's one we've never answered before. I think there are very good arguments that a president should not be able to pardon themselves for obvious reasons. This has nothing to do with President Trump. Um, being able to pardon yourself seems like too much power. If you have committed a federal crime, just the fact that you are president should not get you off the hook for that federal crime. Otherwise, we have a very different system than the one we envisioned, where no man is above the law, to quote the Supreme Court or paraphrase the Supreme Court um, 200 plus years ago in Marbury v. Madison. Um, I do think it's important for um, listeners to know two things in this regard. One is there is nothing in the Constitution that prevents someone from being president if they're convicted of a crime or, frankly, if they're in prison. Uh, the, all the Constitution says is you have to be 35 and a natural born citizen and elected. So none of these things will legally preclude President Trump from running for office or winning or being president if he wins. I also would add that the fact that the Constitution doesn't prohibit it doesn't mean that our founding fathers didn't have an answer to this problem. I would, I am comfortable wagering, in my experience as a constitutional law professor, that what the founders anticipated would happen here is a political solution, an electoral solution, right? That the electorate, the voters, were sophisticated enough to make a decision about whether somebody who was facing serious criminal charges, if we, if we consider them serious, serious criminal charges would not be elected. To the presidency, which is why we've never encountered this before. Um, President Trump has been groundbreaking in lots of ways, not, right, many of them controversial. One of them is that he has engaged in conduct that distinguishes him from his peers and that broke lots of norms about how we should govern. Almost all of them viewed generally as negative moves. Um, it is our responsibility as voters to make that decision and to solve this problem if we think it's a problem. Right. Voters are entitled to think whatever they want. But if we think it's a problem, it's our job to solve it with the vote. The Constitution is not going to solve this for us. Um, and there's lots of situations like that. And I think James Madison would tell us that's what they envisioned, not solving these problems with a high level 14 page document ratified in 1789, but rather by empowering the electorate to make these judgments for the country. Our guest is Louis Varelli. He's a Stetson University College of Law professor, and we're talking about the indictment of former President Trump on Tuesday Cafe. 
coming to you from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We're live on June 20th, and I do want your input. If you'd like to text us at 813-433-0885, you can also email dj at wmnf.org. And uh, uh, Jerome texts in and he says, uh, we talked, we have talked about this, but maybe there's something more you can add, Professor Varelli. I'm curious, do you think that having this trial closer to the election could affect it and how? So is there anything more that you'd like to add to, to that question? Well, I think this goes back to the point I just made, which is um, as, as a constitutional lawyer, I can't help but raise this point, which is the ultimate check on our political branches, on the president and Congress is the vote. And that was by design. So if this is still going on closer to the election, then I think it's absolutely important that voters consider not only the outcome to President Trump, but the conduct being alleged when they decide if they think President Trump is fit to be the chief executive. Again, they are entitled to make any decision they want, but it is not irrelevant. And I think there are some arguments or some people claiming that somehow this is, um, this is a facade. The language of the indictment does not suggest that to me. Uh, the conduct here is unique. The conduct here, the alleged conduct is intentional and directly violative of all meaningful responsibility, all reasonable responsibilities of a former president. And we should take that seriously when voting, frankly, regardless of how far we are from the election, but certainly if it becomes, um, if we're learning more about it as the election draws near. Well, so far we have heard from one side of this, the, the we heard from President Trump earlier, but let's hear from the prosecutor, uh, special counsel, Jack Smith. Here's what he said, uh, just a couple of minutes of what he said when the indictment was unsealed. So here's Jack Smith. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with felony violations of our national security laws, as well as participating in a conspiracy to obstruct justice. This indictment was voted by a grand jury of citizens in the Southern District of Florida. And I invite everyone to read it in full, to understand the scope and the gravity of the crimes charged. The men and women of the United States intelligence community and our armed forces dedicate their lives to protecting our nation and its people. Our laws that protect national defense information are critical the safety and security of the United States, and they must be enforced. Violations of those laws put our country at risk. Adherence to the rule of law is a bedrock principle of the Department of Justice, and our nation's commitment to the rule of law sets an example for the world. We have one set of laws in this country, and they apply to everyone. Applying those laws collecting facts, that's what determines the outcome of an investigation. Nothing more and nothing less. The prosecutors in my office are among the most talented and experienced in the Department of Justice. They have investigated this case hewing to the highest ethical standards, and they will continue to do so as this case proceeds. It's very important for me to note that the defendants in this case must be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. To that end, my office will seek a speedy trial in this matter, consistent with the public interest and the rights of the accused. We very much look forward to presenting our case to a jury of citizens in the Southern District of Florida. In conclusion, I would like to thank the dedicated public servants of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, with whom my office is conducting this investigation and who work tirelessly every day upholding the rule of law in our country. I'm deeply proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Well, that's special counsel Jack Smith speaking when the indictment was unsealed earlier this month. And of course, we're talking about the indictment of former President Trump and our guest who is Joining us this hour uh, is Louis Varelli, Stetson University College of Law professor, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. So, Professor Varelli, uh, is there anything that we should that we heard from the special counsel there, Jack Smith, that um, 
I don't know, kind of gives you gives us insight that we can listen to and, and think about uh, why it was that they brought this now or what what they're most confident in, I guess, sticking, since it seems like they seem pretty confident that um, that they the former president is guilty, but they just have to convince a, a jury of that. Well, I I think what um, Special Prosecutor Smith said was um, pretty standard in terms of what the prosecutor's role should be and what I um, my experience with the Department of Justice has always been that the Justice Department um, takes its choices seriously and is full of competent, serious people prosecuting these cases. Um, I think it's important for people listening to remember that um, Jack Smith's reputation is on the line here too. And he has very little to gain from a failed prosecution. Um, almost not, I mean, personally, nothing to gain, of course. Um, and it is um, sort of the, the appropriate role of a special prosecutor to approach this case as if it is as typical as possible right? as a criminal investigation. Um, the indictment, and again, I'm not a criminal lawyer, so I don't read dozens of indictments, but I'm certainly familiar with their, with their format. The indictment is pretty detailed, which is no surprise, right? The indictment suggests that the reason this took as long as it did was because the prosecutors wanted to collect as much information as possible to create as strong a case as they could before they even chose to seek an indictment. So I think it's important for people listening to Jack Smith there to understand, or at least to um, accept from his perspective that this was a serious decision made carefully. And even if it results in an acquittal, which it very well might, beyond a reasonable doubt is a very high standard of proof for very good reason, um, that it was not done lightly. And the indictment suggests that it wasn't. The, the scope of evidence in the indictment suggests this was taken seriously. So one of the things that the Trump team has to do essentially is to convince the jury that the charges are not worth convicting them about. And so what that has to do, that's essentially that he has to um, create an alternative narrative, perhaps, to what the prosecutor is saying. And and uh, like because it's a criminal um, uh, criminal prosecution, the defendant doesn't have to prove that they're innocent. They just essentially have to uh, convince the jury that they're not worthy of being prosecuted for these uh, for these. Um, crimes. And so it's possible that they will or will not testify or call any witnesses or that the president may or may not take the stand. Uh, how do you think, I mean, I know this is speculation, but what, how might these play out? What are the different scenarios under what that we might expect during the trial, keeping in mind that it's essentially that the, um, they want to create this narrative that the president is not guilty of these crimes? Right. So I think it's really important to to point out exactly what you did. Um, the defense isn't required to do much of anything other than convince one juror that the pres the facts don't support guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So to some very high percentage of certainty, right? I don't have a number for it, but let's call it 95% roughly. Um, that's a very high bar. And again, rightfully so, because criminal punishment is a significant um, choice that the government makes when somebody um, violates the law. Um, so an alternative narrative is useful. And it might be that by challenging the witnesses brought by the prosecution, the defense is able to tell a story of um, much like what President Trump's been claiming um, in his public addresses, political motivation, um, election interference, whatever he wants to call it. Um, I think there's little evidence of that so far. But again, only one juror has to be convinced that the president is less than 95 percent certain to have done what the law prohibits him from doing. Um, or have any other reason not to convict, and that conviction won't happen. So I also think it's it's important, as you pointed out, Sean, to remind people that um, the importance of the indictment, the validity of the indictment, does not hinge entirely on whether there was a conviction. It's going to be judged that way, and I understand why. But it is very hard to get a criminal conviction in a case that's this complicated. right? This is not a simple, for example, drug possession case where we can identify whether someone was holding a certain amount of drugs and that makes them um, guilty under the law. This is a complicated case and to not convict doesn't necessarily mean A, that it didn't happen or more to the point that the prosecution shouldn't have brought the case. That's just the system working. And as far as it's the best system we have for criminal punishment. So the defense has a 
Um, very specific job, and you're right, it is not to prove innocence. And in fact, they should probably not be trying to prove innocence because in a complicated case, that's also very difficult to do. They just want to prove or demonstrate that the prosecution can't prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 jurors or to a full complement of jurors, a unanimous jury. Um, so it is a very different goal. It's going to be mostly about trying to create suspicion or doubt in jurors' minds about the veracity and motivations of the people pro providing evidence. In these cases, I mean, I know this is unprecedented, but in as similar as you can think about for, of a case like this, would it be um, uncommon for the, the person who's accused to take the witness stand? I don't have statistics for you on that. Um, I would be surprised if President Trump's legal team advised him to take the stand. Of course, as we know, one of President Trump's most um, sort of profound qualities is his interest in not following other people's advice necessarily or doing what he chooses to do. And it's, it's his prerogative, but I would be surprised if he testified. There's very little to gain. Um, unless they believe that the jury is going to be particularly sympathetic to hearing from him, in which case I would imagine they would be sympathetic to him without hearing from him. Right? So I think there are lots of um, challenges with a witness testifying. It's a very difficult thing to do, especially under cross-examination. So I would suspect we don't hear from President Trump under oath. Um, and that is not an indication of innocence or guilt. Right? That, that I think is just the appropriate choice in a case like this. And, a, and I think probably the common one, even though I don't have um, statistics for you on how this usually works. Bob writes in, he asks, is there film of Trump at the dinner party showing the docs? And I'm I'm looking at a 19, uh, sorry, 2017 article by Reuters that talks about um, uh, when Trump and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe responded to a North Korean ballistic missile test while visiting the Mar-a-Lago Golf Resort in 2017, and that photos taken by private guests in the club's public dining area showed Trump and Abe conferring and looking at documents while surrounded by their aides following Pyongyang's missile launch. I'm not sure if that's exactly what Bob is talking about there, but um, do you have any any evidence or any anything that you'd like uh, that you remember about that would help answer his question? I don't know, frankly, if there's video, um, but Bob raises an interesting point, which is part of sort of our modern jury system, which is we, have, we are so accustomed to video footage of things now that there is um, sort of evidence in the trial lawyer world, in the jury trial world, that a lack of video evidence tends to draw suspicion from jurors. If there isn't video, it didn't happen. Um, there is evidence in the um, indictment of people having conversations about seeing these documents and being shown them, people saying that they were shown them, and those being people who were not allowed to see them. Um, so there is evidence to that effect. I don't know if it's video evidence, but it's a good point that Bob makes that um, the presence of video, the the ubiquitous nature of video evidence is both a blessing and a curse, right? It can be useful, but it can also um, be problematic if we expect it to occur everywhere. As far as President Trump having dinner with um, Prime Minister Abe and having potentially sensitive documents there, having that in a public dining room, again, probably a bad idea, not a violation of the Espionage Act, because it's not likely that any of the people around that table were not permitted to see those documents. Um, but there's certainly a, a line to be drawn there. If you walked across the room and showed them to somebody, then of course we'd have a similar problem. That should not be something that a president ever does. Um, and it should not be surprising to someone who holds the office, someone who hears a top secret security briefing every morning in the Oval Office about the dangers in the world around us, is aware that these things are a secret. Um, so I think um, that's an interesting example of sort of where the line might be. Um, but Bob raises an interesting point about video evidence. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, but I want to thank you very much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Professor Varelli. Thank you so much for having me. Louis Varelli is a Stetson University College of Law professor, and we've been talking about the indictment of former President Trump. And if you missed, missed any of this interview, you can watch the video beginning this afternoon. It'll be on our website, wmnf.org. Tuesday Cafe also airs on the television station TBAE on Tuesdays at 8 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener and our producer today, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. And coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. They'll speak with the NAACP's Yvette Lewis about tonight's 
Stay Woke gathering in Tampa. This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on June 20th from the studios of WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. Thanks so much for listening. And thanks to everyone who contributed during our recent fund drive. You can still donate at WMNF.org. Thanks for listening.